Greetings to you, brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. Good to see each one here. So, uh, I'm going to continue in uh, the study in 1 Corinthians. So, I believe it was two weeks ago I preached, something like that. And I thought back over some of the stuff that I, uh, I talked about, or the chapter finished <clears throat> chapter two, but for whatever reason, study, study came hard for me yesterday, if any of you can relate to that. But uh, the Lord reminded me that it's not me getting up here and just saying everything just right, that's, that's, that's actually going to bring forth fruit. It's not, um, it's not me. And it's confirmed in our passage that ministers are just servants. Ministers are servants. So it's, um, I'm merely a servant of God. And if you came with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, like Joe read this morning, if you came with that, uh, God's promise is that his, his word will not return to him empty. So I need to remember that it's God, and it says that in our passage this morning in 1 Corinthians 3. It's God that gives the increase. It's not me. But hopefully I can present the truth of the word this morning. So... First Corinthians chapter three. I'm going to tie in back to two verse fourteen because we talked about that, and I'll we'll just do a little review, and I'll tie that in with my points this morning. Before we get started, let's let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you would be here. In our midst, you know uh, the frailty of man and myself, and I pray that you would give strength and you would give wisdom and understanding this morning, and your spirit would be present with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, but I'm going to begin in verse 14 of chapter 2, and I'll read those three verses at the end. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> and we'll read chapter, uh, uh, first nine verses in chapter three a little later. But um, the natural man. So I wanted to, I wanted to highlight, and it's a good, and there's a good chance that in a group this size, we have we may have three types of people. We may have people that would be considered the natural man, the carnal man, which starts in chapter 2, the carnal man, and then also he ties in with that, the spiritual man or the carnal man versus the spiritual man. And he did a little bit of that in chapter 2 where he... he talked about the natural man versus the spiritual man. So as I was thinking ahead about chapter chapter 3, I was thinking now, so is this natural man, is that, is that the same? Because I know he's, he, he right away begins by talking about the carnal man. But hopefully I can clear that up in our minds this morning. Through the, and I'll, we'll just make it three points. And so we're looking at the natural man first, coming out of verse 14. And this is a little recap. This is a little review because I talked about 
a little bit of this last week. I touched on it, and I'm going to highlight it again. Not last week, the week before, I believe it was. So natural, if you look up the word, means of the soul or of the mind. It also means sensuous, lower nature, animal. What is natural as it relates to physical life alone, apart from the working of God and His Spirit. So that's, that's kind of what the definition of a natural man out of verse 14. And it's clear, it's clear from that verse, if you look at it, that the natural man is not a believer in Christ. The person without the Spirit. The, uh, I believe it's the NIV that translates natural as, instead of natural man, it says the man without the Spirit. And notice what it says. He doesn't receive, he doesn't accept the things from God or of God that come from the Spirit of God. And number two, he considers them foolishness and does not understand them. So, the natural man, let's think about this, as he's living his life, how does he, um, how does he make his de decisions, or how, how could I word this? What does he fall back, what's his reference as to what he bases his um, decisions in life on? Because we see from the verse that he doesn't factor in. You know, sometimes we make a big decision. We, we, we think about it in a spiritual sense. What does this mean for me? How is this going to affect me spiritually? Well, he doesn't factor that in, um, the natural man. Because he doesn't understand it. And it's also, why would he, would he factor it in? It's foolishness to him. So... What are his decisions based on? And I pointed this out the last time. Well, what is left of the soul? A natural man is of the soul, and he's of the mind. And so uh, <clears throat> his decisions are made by, you know, what makes, what makes sense to his mind. What makes sense? What, uh, what does he feel is right? Or what is good for me? And so, the next definition that's, that's uh, or next word they had in, in the definition of a natural man is the word sensuous. And I, I talked about this word last couple of weeks ago, and it's of the senses, of our senses. We all have senses. So, sensuous is of the senses. And one that, that caught my eye when I looked up the word sensuous was a person, one that is highly susceptible to influence through the senses. That's a sensuous person. So I got to thinking, you know, I, I fish a little, I hunt a little, and that is, that's how we, that's how we catch fish. That's how we hunt turkeys. Uh, that's how you train an animal through their senses. That's, that's what you have to work with. Um, they don't have uh, a spirit. So through their senses, you can do two things. You can motivate them through their senses to do what you want them to do. Or you can do what some hunters do and you deceive them through their senses you deceive them because your end goal is to kill them. So you can motivate them through their senses or you can deceive them. And then, um, yeah, that's the, the, uh, the objective of a hunter is to take the game. And so you, you use what is as available uh, to you, and that's their senses because they are sensuous. So a natural man is sensuous. 
Then we have our emotions. You know, we all have emotions. Our emotions are constantly giving us feedback. We're happy. We're sad. We are, um, we're worried. We're confident. We're um, angry. You know, we could name a lot of different emotions that we feel and express. But one thing about our emotions, we all have emotions, we're made emotional people, but our emotions are fickle. They change a lot. One day you can be feeling depressed, the next day the sun, sun will come out and shine and you, you remember that you were feeling depressed yesterday, but you're feeling pretty chipper today. So that's our emotions. Um, now to say that a Christian, to say that a Christian never makes um, a decision or choices based on his emotions or his what his mind tells him is that's not true. I think we all would say we make little decisions every day that are based on our emotions or just what our mind tells us. And they're, they're inconsequential. They, they're, they're, not, they're not here nor there necessarily, not necessarily wrong. And, but I believe it was the last, yeah, that was the last time I said, don't let your emotions, now young people, listen to me, and it's not just for young people, it's, it's for me, it's for me too, it's for middle-aged people, it's for older people. But I said, don't let your emotions make big, important decisions for you. You know, I'm in love. Young people, all of a sudden they fall in love. Don't, you know, don't let your emotions make a big, important decision for you. Um, and there's, there's other examples we could give. But as I thought about this, you know, the more the more disciplined a person you are, and you may be disciplined in this area, but not this area, but the more disciplined, as more of a disciplined person that you are overall, I believe, if, if I'm right, as I think about it, the less you let your, your emotions make decisions for you. In other words, this is what I'm going to do, whether I feel like it or not. And, and I know we all have things like this that we, that we, uh, you come up against every day. I don't really feel like it. How many times have you heard that? Or how many times have you said it to yourself or your children said it to you? Um, but one thing I'll, I'll say, just because you are a disciplined person, I want to make, make this clear, that does not mean you're a spiritual person. But I believe spiritu spirituality will bring um, a measure of discipline to your life because we just... We don't just do the things we feel like doing. And so I thought, let's think back over our lives. Take about a month. How many decisions were made? And like I said, a lot of small ones. But how many decisions were made in your life in the last month that were based on your emotions? I mean, maybe you can think of some, maybe you can't. Uh, it's just uh, something I thought about. You know, we, uh, I'll say this for the benefit of a couple people here, talking about taking ice baths. I, uh, I really wanted to, but my feelings just got in the way. So far, my feelings, my emotions have, my feelings got in the way. They just, they restrained me. And you could say, well, that 
could be good or it could be bad. Depends how you look at it. And so um, that's to make my point, some decisions are in, inconsequential. But some are not. And so how many just think back over your week or tomorrow? Your, your alarm's going to ring at whatever time you decide to set it, unless you don't set an alarm. And you're going to do a couple of things. You might turn it off, roll over, you might go back to sleep. But you're, you may or may not feel like getting out of bed. But you'll probably get out of bed even if you're an adult and you're and you have a responsibility, I'm going to say you'll probably get out of bed, whether you feel like it or not. So that's maybe an example. Um, and, and you could think about children. Go down and eat breakfast. I don't want to eat, you know, this. I don't, I want to eat candy. Well, they feel like eating candy because they're a child. But... We tell them, no, you eat a healthy breakfast. We don't just eat whatever we feel like at any time of the day. So, uh, and halfway through the day, I thought of this. You get tired. Halfway through the day, you get tired. And I'm not saying you can't rest. It's a good idea to rest. But, you know, we get tired and we don't just quit halfway through the day because we feel tired. So you get my point. Um, there's value in not letting what you feel or your emotions dictate your actions. What about, I thought of this, what about when it comes to spiritual things? What about getting up? Oh, it's Sunday morning, I get to sleep in. Because I feel like sleeping in. What about getting up, getting up early, getting to church on time? Um, getting up and uh, read the word, whatever you could go out for a, a nice walk, energize yourself, uh, go out and pray, see God's uh, creation, look at the, the sunrise, you know, a lot of that, some of that, those things you say, I don't feel like getting out of bed, but once you, once you're you say, I'm not going to let my emotions uh, run my life. And you get up and you do those things. You look back and you say, well, I'm, I'm glad I got up. I'm glad I didn't do what I felt like doing. So um, come home from work at night. I'm tired. I don't feel like going to prayer meeting. So what do you do? If I would ask all the people in here that, you know, spiritual are we spiritual? Do we, do we always feel like going to prayer meeting? We may not always feel like it, but do we let our feelings rule or win? I'm going to go whether I feel like it or not. And you go and you receive a blessing and you say, well, I'm, I'm, glad, I, I'm glad I went. Um, I don't want to study my Sunday school lesson. I'm not the teacher anyway. What does it matter? So we don't. So we're just letting our feelings and our emotions rule our lives. Now this is, this is a definition of a natural man. He is of the soul, he is of the mind, and he is sensuous. So I thought if I could, if I could get your mind uh, stirred in that way or I don't have time I don't have time for this I don't have time for that well what's important you know do this do this little test at the end of at the end of the week look at the look at the screen time on your phone how much screen time did you have this week look at the, the amount of hours that are there and then then think did I have time for that if you think you don't have time for, for certain things, say, wow, that, may, that, may, that amount of hours, surely not. Did I have time for that? Well, so what's important? 
What is important? Are you governed by your senses? Are you sensuous? Challenge to me. And I wrote down a couple questions after I preached a couple weeks ago that came to mind um, through various um, thinking. And here's one. I just can't seem to love a certain person. Well, what? Why not? Well, they're unlovable. You know, you can go into all. You can go into all your reasons why. Can you? I have a question for you, and this is something you can think about. Can you love someone without feeling it? Can you love someone without feeling it? Now, ideally, we we would say, yeah, I. I would like to feel loving toward that person, but what if you don't? Can you love them anyway? Because we always, sometimes we get it backwards. We think, well, I need to have the feeling, and if the feeling is, it is not in my heart, well, then what's the point of doing it anyway? Because I'm just, I'm just going through the motions. That's not in my heart anyway, so why would I do it? I'm a hypocrite. I I understand the honesty, but I still don't quite agree with that uh, mentality. Um, choose, choosing to love God. Do we choose to love God or we, f- we feel, I mean, hopefully we feel love toward God once we, you know, we know what all God has accomplished for us. And we should feel love toward God. But what if we don't? Can we choose to love God anyway? Or maybe flip that around. You know, um, depressed people will will say, um, I just don't feel God's love for me. I just don't feel it. And that is probably exactly true. That's true. They don't feel it. But does that mean that God does not love you? So I I think my whole point, my point in saying this is don't let our our feelings, our emotions get in the way of making the right choice. Some choices are, some things are inconsequential, but not, not all are. And don't let your feelings get in the way. Because if you are governed by your senses... you would be considered a sensuous person. And that's what the natural man is because that's what they have of the soul, of the mind. So that's a, that's a, uh, a definition of the natural man. And I just think it's important in this, in, this whole, in this whole day and age of follow your heart, follow your dreams, follow your passions. You know, you hear those kind of things all all the time, written on people's shirts and slogans that are similar to that everywhere. We're, we're bombarded with that. Follow your heart. But that's not, that's a sensuous person. That's not, Jesus did not say that, by the way. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That don't sound very pleasant, does it? So, a natural man, the description of a natural man. Now we're going to read chapter 3 up to verse 9. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither Yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So he's asking this question to these people numerous times. 
Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So I wanted to highlight the natural man as opposed to what we see in this passage, which he starts with carnal. I could not address you as people who are spiritual or live by the Spirit, but as carnal. So just two verses earlier in the verses we just read, I'll just highlight this in verse 15, Paul said, a spiritual person, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. And last week, two weeks ago, I gave you three words, appraise, uh, evaluate, and discern discern and so you could numerous translations put those words in in the place of the word judge Uh, so if we think of it like this if you appraise something and we right away think of real estate you put a value on it you put a you set a value on it or you evaluate the the worth of it and, and I use the word evaluate, and that is to determine or fix the value of. And to discern is to see or understand the difference. So a spiritual person appraiseth, or he evaluates all things. So seeing, as I was saying earlier, all these little things in our life, we see well, what's, what's this worth? Is this doing anything? Is this doing any good in my life? What's this worth? We evaluate or we discern, is this good? Is this bad? All things, the spiritual person. And we see that, oh, this has some value. It may be a little bit of value. This has much value. This has no value. And if you're constantly doing things that have no value if you're spiritual and you appraise that and you say these things have no value in my life you should stop you should stop even if you, you're doing a thing that has a little bit of value well that's it has some value even Paul uses that verse um, bodily exercise and I didn't look this up, but it's just, it's coming to me, profiteth little. It, it does profit a little bit. It has some value. And now you, some people would use that verse to say, well, it profits such a little bit in, uh, what's, the, what's the next part of the verse? Can somebody help me out with that? As opposed to the spiritual, I, I can't think how he, bodily exercise profiteth little There you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, You could look at it two ways. It profits little compared to godliness, so we should throw it. That's, I don't believe that's what Paul is saying. I believe bodily exercise has a little bit of profit, so, but next to godliness or the things that really count in life, it's, it's little, but it's, it has some. So what I'm saying is if there's things that you evaluate or you appraise in your life and you say, what's this worth? What's this worth? And you conclude, this is worth nothing in my life. It's worth nothing. Then stop. Stop. 
Okay. That is going back a little bit, but that's, um, that's a spiritual person. A spiritual person evaluates all things. And we talked about that a little bit uh, last week and, and the wording on that there, but let, let, we're going to move on now. But I could not address you as spiritual people, but carnal. So we're going to look at carnal just quickly here. Carnal, carnal, fleshly, worldly. That's three words that the numerous translations jump between to express this idea. Carnal, fleshly, worldly. Um, and then he gives us a little more, more light. Even as babes or infants in Christ. And so... Carnal, fleshly, worldly believers. Is that a thing? And he calls them infants in Christ. He calls them brethren at the beginning. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, but let's look at infants. Infants are in the beginning stages of their, of their life. But they have life. See? See? They're not fully developed, but they have life. And they are, therefore, they're, they're fed with milk because they're not fully developed. And we're very, we're very familiar with, with the imagery here. We're familiar with this passage, but infants are fed with milk, not with solid food, because they're not fully developed, but they don't stay on milk. So if, if you're familiar with a baby, they're on milk, and then you might move them to applesauce, and then you might move them to, to peaches or half-smashed up food. And then finally, when they get enough of all that, you can kind of move them to real solid food. And they can engage or do battle with real food, not just that mush in a can or whatever, the stuff that comes out of the grinder. And so Paul's saying, you weren't ready for it. And so you, you weren't ready for it because you were infants, understandable. But then he says, you're still not ready for it. Well, that's a problem. You're still not ready for it. He says that in verse, uh, you were not able to bear it. Neither are you able, neither yet now are you able to bear it. So what I want, to, what I want you to remember it, out of here is that's um, that's not normal. It's normal at first, but it's not normal that you're still not able to handle it. Okay, so if you have a child, and we get this, we've heard this many times, it reaches three, four, five, six, and they're still on milk and they can't handle solid food, you would become concerned and you'd say, uh, I think something's wrong. This is not normal. So milk, um, we kind of would understand this in, this in this imagery as the elementary things, the elementary things of God or the gospel, the easy to understand things, and me as maybe the deeper truths of God that are not so easy to grasp or understand. And I would like to read in Hebrews just to, to tie it in with this. So for a Christian has been a believer for a while and has not moved on to a deeper understanding is still an infant in Christ, according to this passage. And if that goes on for too long, that should be concerning. Just as you would have a 10-year-old child that would only drink milk and you say, that, I'm concerned because this is not normal. And so in the same way. So I am, I am going to... Just flip over to Hebrews 5 and just read this along with uh, that idea because that's the other place in the Bible where it speaks similar words. And it would start in verse 11, I guess I'll start. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And that actually means you don't want to understand and you are lazy. 
You're dull of hearing. You're lazy. Then he says, for when, for when the time, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk. Here we have these, these terms again, milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, an infant. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses. Notice that they have their senses exercised. I talked about senses. Exercised to discern both good and evil. Remember what the spiritual person does? Appraiseth, discerneth, evaluates. Here it, here it reinforces that have their senses exercised to, to discern both good and evil. Uh, I believe, yeah, I'll stop there. That's the end of the chapter. I was going to include verse 6-1. I was just looking at it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Okay, we'll stop there. So I just wanted to... Uh, highlight that with this um, with this description Paul was giving of an infant to read that passage out of Hebrews. So to understand carnality, fleshly, worldly behavior a little better, believers sometimes exhibit carnal or worldly behavior. In Galatians 5, I don't believe I'll turn there, but in, in Galatians 5, there's, there's a list of what Paul calls the works of the flesh. And that's, what, that's basically the word carnality, what it means. It means fleshly. But there Paul describes it as kind of this war, this war between between the spiritual, the spirit of God and the spiritual man and the carnal man, this war that's going on between the spirit and the flesh. And he says this, if you walk by the spirit, you will not gratify or fulfill the lust of the flesh. So according to that verse, when you are carnal or not walking by the spirit, or when, you're, when you are carnal or fleshly, you are not walking according to the Spirit or by the Spirit. So let's not excuse carnality uh, by thinking, well, everyone is, everyone is carnal now and then. Everyone's, you know, almost like I can, I can get my carnality in here and there also. Let's not excuse it in that way because when you are fleshly, you're not walking according to the Spirit. It's not um, normal Christian behavior. And, and, if you, and if you're here thinking, well, the, the Corinthian church was, they were Christians, they were brethren, and they were in Christ, yet they were so very carnal. Um, so they were still Christians. I have a passage in Romans, and I'm glad this came to me. This is a good description. How does God view carnality? Does God look at it as I just described? Uh, let's, uh, let me read this. I think we, gotta, we need to read this with what I said to give us some insight into how God looks at carnality or fleshly behavior. Romans 8 verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I believe I'll stop there. So what I wanted, I wanted you to see is a couple things. Carnally, to be carnally minded is death. And if you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. So to be carnal is, um, it's not normal Christian behavior. So let's not excuse our carnality by thinking, well, the, Chris, the Corinthians were, they were Christians, and they had a lot of carnality. So I'm good. Let's not do that. So verse 3, back to verse 3, chapter 3 of our text. And I think what Paul was communicating to these people, as, as, I, as I've got this far in the book and kind of got their mindset, I think what he was communicating here was probably a shock to them because I believe they were, they were wise or thought they were wise. They, they had a lot of gifts in the church. Um, maybe a little bit, I'm thinking there's somewhere here in the book that maybe indicates that they had some they were a little proud of their of their wisdom and of their gifts. And so I think what when Paul brought it to them this way, I I'm kind of imagining that they were possibly a little shocked. You mean us like infants in Christ were way past that, you know? But Paul just called it what it was. So evidences of carnality in uh, verse 3 is envying, strife, divisions. And back in chapter 1 when he brings this up, he uh, he, he, uh, says contention. And so it it, it all sort of centers around this this idea of of this, this whole contentious thing that was going on was which leader do I which leader do I follow which leader do I choose or which which party am I in which which camp am I in I'm I'm in the Paul the Paul camp or in the next one say well no I'm I don't subscribe to him I follow Peter or I follow Apollos and then the next person said well you're all wrong I follow Christ um, so, so it was this, this um, group mentality of following and maybe exalting a man that Paul is um, addressing here. And he said, you're acting like, some translations say, you're acting like mere humans. And they could have said, well, that's what we are, right? Humans. Um, as opposed to what? And I believe what Paul, and I said this maybe in the introduction of the book, the book of Corinthians is how does the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus, impacting my life, this area of my life? Um, And he says, right here, this area of your life, it's not. The gospel is not changing you and impacting you. In fact, you're acting like mere humans instead of someone that's controlled by the Spirit of God. So, verse 5, how did Paul say that they should look at him, Apollos, and Peter? They are, the King James says, they're ministers, and that word means servants. They are servants. So servants have masters. Paul said we are just servants. We're not someone to be exalted. We're not someone to be followed. Yes, we are the leader. Um, respect is, is in order, but not an exaltation of man. And um, 
Each servant has a task he's assigned to, and he goes on down through the, the passage here. I did, and he uses some more word pictures, as in growing a garden. I'm the, the one plants, the one waters. We each have our tasks, but we're just servants. Servants, they would have been familiar. The servants that, that tended the, the, uh, the garden were just servants. So Paul is highlighting Jesus as their master and servant leadership among uh, the leaders. Verse 9, we are co-workers together in God's service. So we talked about the, uh, the carnal man. I'm just going to close with a few thoughts about the spiritual man. To be spiritual, to be a spiritual man, Jesus said, you must be born of the Spirit, born again. Like Jesus, he explained to Nicodemus. And you may have heard this before, you know, someone might have said, well, we're, we're all God's children, right? And whatever they mean by that, whether they mean that, you know, God is, well, God is ultimately the reason why every human being is here. Without God, nothing could have happened. Nothing, we couldn't exist. But if someone says we're all God's children, that's not biblically correct. And I want to show you, there's a verse I'm going to read to you out of John 1, verse 12. But as many, we're, we're thinking about a spiritual, spiritual man, as many received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Notice that, to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So who are the sons of God in the verse? Whoever receives him and those that believe on his name, we then become the sons of God. So we were not born children of God. If you believe that you were born a child of God, then you're wrong because we were not born children of God at our birth. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Ephesians 2 says, we were by nature, now remember, natural, the natural man. We were by nature, what were we? Were we children of God by nature? Children of wrath by nature, we were children of wrath. So to be spiritual, we need to be born of the Spirit. And when we're born of the Spirit, we will begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit as evidence that we were born of the Spirit. So just a, a little bit on the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And as I was studying, a verse of song came to my mind, and I got most of it right, and then as I got down through, I started drawing some blanks, so I had to look it up. But the part that, come, that, that came to me was, born of the Spirit, born of the Spirit with life from above. Now, I, th I thought I had this better than this. I wrote it down, but I, I don't really want to look at it. <laughs> it's the song, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine. And this is the great thing about songs that are, that are uh, I don't know, theologically correct or packed with information. Justified fully through Calvary's love. I believe I said blood whenever I was, I think it's Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. So I will look down make sure I got it right. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. So you say, how, how does this happen? How are you born of the Spirit? Right here, the transaction, and, and it's a song. It's not a Bible verse, but it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, 
uh, theologically correct song. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh praise his dear name. And I'd like to close with that. And then, of course, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. So it's just, I'm glad that song came to me also as a kind of way to wrap that up, talking about the spiritual man. So we had the natural, we had the carnal, and we had the spiritual. So as you evaluate your, your life, what, what kind of man or woman are you? And I believe I said enough. So I will close, and it is 10 till 12. I will open it up briefly if someone has something that they'd like to, to say, add, clarify, or any correction. You just raise your hand. If not, we'll close. All right. I thank you all for your attention and for being here and let us we had announcements so let's rise and have a prayer